So I'm not here to bash schools or, or, or put down schools, but I do think that we've kind of come to a place in, in society that we really need to rethink the idea of schools. Um, I'm really a believer in schools, uh, and even more so, I'm a big believer in, in teachers. Uh, if you look at this particular photograph, um, if you look at almost all of the photos that I have uh, from my early school days, I'm right beside the teacher. There's a good chance you probably bullied me. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting to see that, but like, if I keep on looking through the photos, that, that was me. I really uh, enjoyed schools. I, enjoyed, I remember the kindness, I remember the warmth, I remember my teachers. So I'm a big advocate for teachers. Um, but I think learning, when we think about learning and how, um, how our learning actually developed, uh, I believe that a lot of the independent learning, the drive that I gained, wasn't all from school. And I'm not saying that school uh, left me behind in that particular um, circumstance, but I think it's really important to understand that we do have drive ourselves. Um, and I can think back to a particular event. Um, it was Christmas Eve, 1984, and this was under my tree, right? And this really changed, and I wonder if you can identify that computer, but that was the Apple IIc. All my friends had the E's, this was, the C was for compact, which it really wasn't that compact, because you had to take this big monitor and carry it around, because uh, it didn't do anything by itself. But it was amazing to get this particular device, because it really changed the world uh, for me. It really changed everything for me. Uh, my first app was Print Shop, and I would create these like 12 foot long banners uh, and all night, the song of the dot matrix printer, <laughs> it was just amazing. I don't know how my parents slept at all, really. And I would do these like banners that would say stuff like, keep out of my room, George, you know, that sort of <laughs> stuff like that. And it'd create gift cards and, you know, all of these strange things. But that was my real, my really my first, uh, uh, my killer app, I guess. And I became like a, a publishing mogul overnight. Then when I kind of got sick of that for about you know, two or three months later, I got really into these magazines like uh, Nibble and Compute. And you'd open these things up and there'd be lines of code in AppleSoft Basic. And you'd type this stuff up and then maybe if you're lucky, like a little text rocket would fly up in the air. If you were lucky, because there were so many typos in these things, you had to actually figure out what the typos were. Um, so I'd spend a lot of time like problem solving, figuring this out. And really I learned about code and problem solving in different ways. And I was really into this. It was uh, quite amazing. Um, and this, so I was already discovering what George Siemens talks about here. Um, informal learning is a significant aspect of our learning experience. Formal education is no longer, it no longer comprises the majority of our learning. So back then for me, that was just a tiny little bit, a slice really of this informal learning. It wasn't everything, but really today when we have the internet uh, and so on, that this huge, this little tiny slice becomes something very, very big. So I look at my daughter, this is Rain here. Um, she was learning iMovie, she's five years old. She's, she takes video with her little flip camcorder, then sticks it into her MacBook Pro, chops it up, and she can upload it to YouTube, which is just amazing. Like she's five years old, and I wanna say all day that she's an exceptional kid, um, I, and I really do believe that, but I think that other kids that age can do that as well. And I think that's just amazing. Like this is the same skill I teach my undergrads, like at 18 to 22 years old. <laughs> I go in and I teach them step by step how to drop things and do transitions and so on. And she's doing this at five just by mimicking what I do and just discovering it herself, you know, trial and error. It's just an amazing learning environment. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about, first of all, the changes that we've seen in society. And, and Howard Rheingold actually talked a lot about those. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the inspiration, some of the teachers that are really breaking away from classrooms that we've seen in the past and uh, towards this, the road ahead, so some simple ideas, because I don't have time to talk about the big ideas, but some simple ideas about how we can kind of advance and go ahead. So first of all, the changes. Um, here we go. And that's my boy. I keep on sneaking my kids in here. I, you know, it's like just showing photos to everybody. That's my boy, all right, and his cell phone. Um, <laughs> he's like a year there. Uh, so access is really a big one. Like access to mobile technologies is absolutely huge. Uh, if you look at Morgan Stanley's uh, recent analysis, if you're looking at uh, in the next two or three years, so about, about 2012, 2013, we're going to see more mobile access devices connecting to the internet than desktop devices. And this is really huge if we think about it. We're, we're leaving the era of the personal computer or the desktop computer towards this mobile access. But we still run into 
uh, problems with schools saying no mobile access. We're, we're basically getting to this point where we actually have one-to-one -one computing, the thing that we've strived for, the holy grail of, of school, but we continue to say no mobile access. Um, there's a recent Horizon report that talks about trends that we should look, be looking at, not, K, just, not just create K-12 education, but also higher ed. We really need to pay attention to mobile access. Uh, the second big one that we have to, talk, to think about is this idea of open content. And some of you may know open content. Uh, to read it out there, describes any kind of creative work in a format that explicitly allows copying and modifying of uh, its information by anyone, not exclusively by a closed organization, firm, or individual. Uh, if you look here, there's examples of TED, for instance. There is MIT Open Courseware. There's you know, a number of full courses that you can download from the web. There's uh, lectures on uh, iTunes from Stanford. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can get. Uh, Com the OER Commons, the Open Educational Resources Commons, where you can get all sorts of resources and content. Content is just out there, but we're not even looking at this stuff. How many people know about the Creative Commons, if you can show hands here? So every kid should know about the Creative Commons, but when I go into the schools, they don't know about the Creative Commons, and it's something that we all as a society should talk about, copy left and copy right. Um, and it's not just big institutions doing this. Salman Khan here. This is a uh, uh, he was a former businessman. What he decided to do, basically what happened was he was tutoring one of his cousins uh, on using something called Microsoft Doodle Pad or something like that. I've never even heard of it. Um, tutoring his cousin and, and all of a sudden the rest of his family said, hey, can you tutor us as well and our kids as well? So he started doing this a bit more and more. And then eventually he started to take these little screencasts and upload them to YouTube. And eventually it became like 2,000 videos. So this guy basically said, like, he's getting so many people watching his videos that I'm just going to quit my job, I'll start a not-for-profit, not and he's teaching the world. Now, it says something like 29 million uh, lessons served, I guess 29 million hits probably on his, uh, on his YouTube videos. But there's one person that's teaching the world in this way, and perhaps not a teacher, but uh, in a sense, he's creating all this content for other people to look at. Then there's a the whole piece of, you know, beyond access, there's this idea of participatory media. And Howard talked a lot about participatory media. Um, sometimes we think that it's just nothing. It's just YouTube videos. And we have all sorts of examples like that. <laughs> so most of you know David after the dentist. This is a seven-year-old kid who ended up on the internet. This is him leaving the dentist. I'll show you a little piece of that if you haven't seen it. So this was seen like 78 million times than that. And you know, it, it, this, this audience that just grew out of this, the first time I saw it, it was like 10,000 hits. And I thought, this is going to be so viral. You could just tell when you saw it. Uh, this, you know, there's dozens of remixes because uh, the, the ability to do this is quite easy. This is my favorite one. A guy dressed up as Chad Vader and decided to remix this particular um, video. Anyway, for a guy to go and do that, I'm assuming it's a guy, to go do all of that and, and put it up to YouTube, it just kind of, it just kind of amazes me, like, who's got that much time? But it's really, it is really something. If you look at this, the bigger picture, besides all those YouTube videos, the bigger picture is every single person here has some sort of recording device that they can plug into a computer and do something with, uh, publish it, and there's a good chance that at least your friends will see it or just about anyone will see it. And we're really at this point where we're really mediating our reality. So if you look at this particular photograph put up closer, this was Obama in Berlin, 2008. It's a fairly um, famous photograph by now, but just look at the devices in that picture. It just totally amazes me. The one guy's got the computer, which just blows me away. Like, who brings the computer? <laughs> like, 
And I think that's just great, but really we're mediating. Well, what, what are people doing with this? Are they sending it up to YouTube? Are they saying they were there on Facebook? Are they tagging it, you know, tweeting it? All of the different ways of, of, of working with this media today. And that's why it doesn't surprise me when you see stats like this. Um, as of like three days ago, the stat from the YouTube blog was that every single minute there's 35 hours of video that's uploaded. That's just totally amazing to me if you start thinking about it. 35 hours. Now, even if you took like 34 and a half hours of cat videos and babies crying or whatever, <laughs> even if you left with one half hour or even a minute of good educational stuff, we're really into something here. Um, the third little piece is, is around social networks. This is actually from, uh, uh, from Flowtown, which actually looked at the world uh, if it were a social network. So you can see there's like 500 million people on Facebook, which is just, it, it creates this huge country here. Um, Howard Reingold, who you met just earlier, one of the things that he said was, uh, understanding how networks work is one of the most important literacies of the 21st century, and I'm totally behind him on this one. Understanding how we mediate relationships, how we can get things done using networks is totally amazing. Um, my educational theorist is Zay Frank. I don't know how many people know who Zay Frank is. If he should be in an education text, really honest, because some of the things he's done just are absolutely amazing. This is my favorite of his challenges. He had to show called The Show, um, which he did kind of a vlog, which was for, for about a whole year, almost every day. And one of the things that he did was, uh, the, if, if the were, Earth were a sandwich challenge, where he basically challenged the world to take two pieces of bread and basically find global opposites and lay these pieces of bread on the ground so you can make the fir world's first Earth sandwich. Um, <laughs> And so he had this song for it and this really cool challenge and he gave people a particular tool to do this. And then finally, like a group from uh, New Zealand and a group from Spain actually did this and they videoed their process of getting to create this first earth sandwich. And it was really quite a challenge. Um, he's, another one that he did is Young Me, Now Me, where he gets people to upload photographs of themselves way back in the day and of course in the future. And it's actually really good. Uh, I've done it with my own family. Like 30 years later, we did the same family photograph uh, years later. This is not Zay Frank, but I just wanted to show you man babies. <laughs> because I, I, anyway, so you switch the faces on, anyway. Man babies in a TEDx talk, that's right. Um, <laughs> if you look at social media in terms of those networks, into the more, more important things, I guess, you start to think about politics. Uh, the underdog in the recent Calgary mayoral election, uh, Nahid Nenshi, Basically, 398,000 YouTube views versus Barbara Higgins to 67,000. So I don't know if that's a result of, or if, if social media was the driver, or it's a reflection of what actually happened. But more and more, people who understand how to use social media will have more power, certainly in the political arena. Movember, you may have heard of it. Right now, people who are growing mustaches for uh, prostate cancer awareness. This is a global initiative uh, through, through social media. And you've heard of Reddit today. Uh, Reddit is a social news group, which I think is fantastic. This is one of the best stories I've seen from Reddit. Um, this is a girl named Kathleen Edward who was diagnosed with uh, Huntington's disease, and she was bullied by this 33-year-old neighbor, like just horrible bullying. You can look it up, but it, it reached national news and so on. And then all of a sudden, Reddit mobilized. They saw this, and people from Reddit uh, created this, this um, uh, funding drive that basically got her to... Um, got her like a shopping spree and a really big party, which was really cool. So on the day of her party, she you know, had this big sign like, thank you, Reddit, which is really cool, like how social networks can mobilize and do some amazing things to touch the lives of people. Um, as teachers, the one thing that's sort of missing is we don't really get this so far. I mean, there's a lot of teachers that are doing it, but there's this idea of personal learning networks. A lot of people here in this room are actually teachers who use Twitter uh, in their teaching and learning all the time to learn themselves, but also to connect their classrooms to a lot of people. Uh, so this is an example of what you'd call a personal learning network. There's some literature on it if you want to kind of look at that. But it's the idea that you're in the center of this. You have all of these tools, Web 2.0 tools that are out there. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, Web 2.0 tools there uh, that you're connected to. But beyond that, you have all of these people that you can actually work with. And that's what a personal learning network looks like. So in terms of some of the inspirations that I see almost every day, 
Uh, first example is in Moose Jaw, we have this award-winning teacher by the name of Kathy Cassidy, who in her grade one and two's blog, you can, any of you can read her kids' blog. She connects to people from around the world. Uh, for instance, she wanted to talk about geology, so she connects with a, uh, a geologist, I think, in Colorado. So brings those people in via Skype. Uh, you take a look at the, the grade five choir out of New York City, out of uh, sorry, Staten Island. Um, I don't know if you've seen these kids, but they're just fantastic. All of this grade five chorus, they sing uh, songs, their teacher posts it to YouTube, and they've connected and, and performed with people like Rihanna and uh, uh, Lady, uh, Queen Latifah. Uh, I think they performed for uh, Obama. It was really kind of neat that you take these kids that wouldn't have normally had these experiences, but you give them some amazing experiences. Uh, you look at this grade 10 teacher out of Texas who decided... Um, to basically look at all of the 640 uh, TEDx talks out there and get his kids to analyze it, blog it, and then eventually actually do their own TED talk. And, and I can tell how hard that is by doing one at this moment, right? So, but that's great, that's great 10 kids. That shows, one, there's a lot of really good content out there that we should be using. I know teachers that use TED stuff as their curricula. I mean, they're using this stuff to, to learn a lot of stuff. And then second, trusting your kids enough that they, their work is good enough to be out there on the web which is really kind of an important thing. You get in that idea of audience very quickly. Um, one last example. Here's an example of a, a teacher in Manitoba, a teacher in Ontario, and a teacher from Florida sharing uh, some experiences around uh, the Holocaust. And just an I, I won't have time to talk about this entire um, example, but they're just doing amazing stuff. But sharing really important experiences across classrooms across the world is just an amazing idea that we're not seeing enough of. I guess my point in this is there are hundreds of examples I've got to talk about, but this is not the norm. Uh, collaborative experiences and sharing examples of good teaching uh, across the world is not happening enough. It's not happening in a lot of classrooms because there's a number of issues with, with people blocking, with administrators not getting it, not enough funding, not enough time for teachers. There's some really issues, and this is the future. This is the sort of stuff that could be happening right now, but it's not. So I'm going to look really quickly at the road ahead some ideas to kind of look at how we can change this. Uh, a really good 21st century learning advocate by the name of Will Richardson, he asked the question, what happens to traditional concepts of classrooms and teaching when we can now learn anything, anywhere, anytime? Think of the classroom when that's the possibility, when we can learn anything, anywhere, anytime, and of course, to the extension, is with anyone. So first of all, I want to talk about as schools, I think we need to embrace our reality. We need to embrace, first of all, that our kids are bringing these devices in, that we can connect to anyone in the world, but we're looking at the same old curricula, we're doing the same activities that we always did. We're not embracing this particular reality and doing something with it. I think beyond uh, embracing a reality, when we do that, we ask particular questions. So today, one of the biggest questions right now, what does it mean to be literate? And I don't know if we, anyone can ask that, answer that question. Uh, another one, what is the, how is the context for learning changing? So if we have a different context for learning, how does it change? How do we leverage these new affordances? Another big deal is how do we, need, how do we remove these roadblocks? So we, I really think that we do need to remove roadblocks, um, especially with, as I mentioned, blocks. Content filters is a really big deal. Uh, create a culture of sharing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this whole idea of creative commons is really a, really a big deal, but we're not dealing with that sort of thing in school. Um, but really, this whole idea that sharing is the default. And I think, really, we have to support our educators. One of the biggest deals right now, one of the biggest things right now is there's a lot of great educators with passion out there. They want to do this stuff. They want to make the change. But the, the problem is they don't have the time. And every master's thesis I've ever read about change in teachers is it always comes down to the amount of time people have to make the transition, and we're not giving it to them. So as my last slide here, I just want to kind of look at this idea. Um, I want my kids to value school. I really do. In the future, I want my kids to say, school is a good place. This is the place that I wanted to be when I was a kid, and I hope that you want your kids to value school as well. But I do believe that if we do not make changes soon, schools will be irrelevant in a sense. They will be ir more irrelevant because we're not valuing uh, the context, the social context, and perhaps we're not valuing the way that kids learn today. So all I'm asking for you right now is what should we do about that? So perhaps that's where we start the conversation. Thanks for your time.